Well, I think you guys are incredibly blessed to go to a school that teaches creation. That is incredible. That is a good thing, and I'm here to help equip you for the battle that's raging around you. What's the battle between them? When you go outside those doors, what, what, what's the battle? Anybody know? What do you think? What's true and what's not? That's exactly right. There's a, there's a battle between God's truth and Satan's lies. And I want to help equip you to stand up for God's truth. And not only that, I want to, to equip you so you can poke holes in Satan's lies too. And we're just going to do a little bit of what I do. Um, uh, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time on campuses. And so this is a little bit of what I do. And I like to ask a lot of questions. Okay, so that's a little bit of what I do. I spend a lot of time on campuses. I go wherever God opens the door. I've been at uh, campus, on colleges, churches, schools, conferences, from here to Florida and Pennsylvania to Colorado. And so uh, why do I do this? It's because I want people to put their faith in God and they're getting lied to. And so, excuse me. And so uh, again, we talked about God's truth versus Satan's lies. And I want, I've, my name is Mr. Lauer. And if you forget, just think of a flower, silent F, Mr. Flower. We'll do it the silent Mr. Flower. And my YouTube channel is called Solidify Your Faith. What's my YouTube channel called? Solidify Your Faith. Okay, and what's my name? Brian. Mr. Lauer, and it rhymes with? Flower. Flower, yeah. Yeah, the more you can me mentally image something, the easier it is for you to remember it. I know a guy who went to Pensacola Christian, and his name was Nicholas, and he said, when, whenever he introduced himself, he said, yeah, I'm like John, jolly old St. Nick, just picture me in a Santa suit. And nobody forgot his name. Everybody remembered his name. And so, again, uh, my YouTube channel is called what? Solidify Your Faith. Yeah, you're going to be able to go in there, and you're going to be able to see dinosaur talks, and Noah's flood talks, and lies of evolution talks. There's kid talks. But my goal for you, yeah, I want you to know my YouTube channel. I also want you to know about a baloney detector. We're going to show you how to use it. You guys got a baloney detector? Nope. Okay, that's when you hear foolish or deceitful talking. Deceitful talking. Nonsense. A baloney detector goes like this. Bar. All right? That, what? what? Whenever you hear millions of years or billions of years, that's when your baloney detector should go off, because that's nonsense. And then I'm going to give you questions that you can ask an atheist. There's people that don't believe in God, and there's questions that you can ask them that help them realize they got faith too. And uh, the baloney detector, this is millions of years or billions of years. Whenever you hear millions or billions of years, somebody is talking deceitfully to you, because that's never been observed. That's never been, uh, it's not science. It's a belief system about the past. And is that what the Bible says millions of years ago? No. no. The Bible doesn't say millions of years. So they're trying to get man's ideas into the Bible, and it doesn't work. And I encourage you to ask questions. You know, when I was your age, I thought, you know, if I ask questions, people will think I'm not too smart. Right? And I thought, I look back how silly that is. Number one, who cares what people think? What matters is what God thinks. Okay, and number two is, um, if you don't know something, it doesn't mean you're not smart, it just means you haven't learned it yet. So ask questions. I encourage you to ask a lot of questions. The more questions they ask, the more you're gonna learn. And some of these questions that you ask can't be answered by an atheist. And if it's not answered properly, it doesn't go away. Hopefully it wakes them up at night. It's like this, uh, anybody ever been to Grand Canyon? Anybody? Yeah, big hole in the ground, right? And there, a guy, there used to be a guy who gave tours there, and he said, you know what, I dug that. And a little kid asked him, well, where'd you put the dirt? And he, <laughs> and he said that question haunted him the rest of his life. Where did all that dirt go? So ask questions, wide-eyed and innocent. 
And this is my YouTube channel, Solidify Your Faith. It's got kid talks, college talks, church talks, even basketball talks. I was a coach last year for junior high. Yeah, no pressure there. Uh, any basketball players in here? Oh, look at that. Have they taught you the shoelace prayer? No, that's the first thing I taught my team. It's like when you lace up the shoes, thank God for all your blessings. That you can play, that you can, uh, and then and as you tie it off, thank Jesus for dying for your sins. And we did this before every game. And then you double knot it. I didn't want any untied shoes. Okay, because you could be going in for the winning layup and your shoelace comes undone. So we tied it off. And so you're sealed. You're sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. And then the next shoe, we thanked God for all the people in your life. Your parents, your family, your brothers, sisters, they weren't always going to believe there. My parents are gone. All right, so thank. And then, and then we asked Jesus to help us play in a way that pleases him. Because when you wear that Redeemer Christian Academy uniform, you're not only representing your school, you're representing Christ to the referee, to the other team, to their opponents. And so do what's right and don't let the score impact what you do. Make sure you do it right. Our best game was when we got beat by 30. Yeah, anybody can look good when you're up by 20. And I told the team, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see teams that are down by 20. What kind of character do you have then? And uh, we got beat by 30, but if you walked into that gym, you couldn't tell who was ahead based on their body language. So you just do what's right. But anyhow, that's uh, on, that, on there too. And I give VBS talks. They give me five minutes every VBS to talk to the students. You're going to see some of them up there. And this was in St. Cloud. There was a bunch of business owners that uh, brought hates for these bands and Christian stuff. So a lot of Christians were here. So what questions could I ask a Christian? And so I had the booth and I asked them, hey, when did dinosaurs live? Millions of years ago or thousands of years ago? I'll ask you guys, who thinks dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Who thinks they lived thousands of years ago? All right. See, now that's a tough one. Yeah, and what it showed, and most of the Christians there, they believe that 81 to 51, they believe dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, which tells me there's not a good, they don't have a biblical understanding of dinosaurs. The, the Bible, does the Bible tell us when dinosaurs were made? Anybody? I heard yes. When were dinosaurs made? Are they land animals or sea animals? Land, land animals. Oh, yeah, you can have the, you got dinosaurs in the sea, but technically they're land. Does the Bible tell us when land animals were made? When was that? Day six. Okay. So the Bible tells us land animals, or dinosaurs were made on day six with the other land animals. And then two of every kind of dinosaur got on the ark. They were young, not, they weren't really big yet. And they got on the ark, and then the dinosaurs that weren't on the ark, they got buried in mud, all of them died, and they turned into fossils. That's where we get the fossils. Fossils are a sign of a flood, not millions of years. And then the people died outside the ark, and, and then uh, people called them, they didn't have drag dinosaur. That word wasn't invented until 1841. What did they call dinosaurs before 1841? Dragons, that's right. And there's legends of dragons all over the world. Okay, so that's the biblical interpretation of dinosaurs. They lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. And this is an example of one of my talks at VBS. It may be a little loud, but we'll unpack it. And uh, last year it was an Australian theme. And this year it was a dinosaur theme, but we kept the Australian accent. Good day, mates. I'm here to talk about my favorite dinosaur. What do you think it is? It's got big teeth and big mouth and big legs. What is it? The T-Rex. That's right. He's got big, strong stuff, but he's also got little wimpy arms, doesn't he? Wimpy arms, wimpy arms. But you know what I like about him? They found blood cells in his butt leg bone. That's right. It's just shocking to people because blood cells cannot last millions of years. And don't take my word for it, take the word for the person that found it. Is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. 
Uh, it's not something that any one of us could ever predict or hope for. Yeah, they're just shocked that they find bone cells in a blood in a dinosaur bone. And she was, she saw the blood cells and she couldn't believe it. She said, "Crime and there's blood cells that shouldn't be here." So she did it again and again and again. Seventeen times she did the same thing and saw blood cells. And then she told her boss. She said, "Hey, Jack, Jack Horner, I found blood cells." And what did Jack say? Did he say, "Had a boy or had a girl, Mary"? You know, you've done something nobody's ever done in the history of the world. Did he say that? No, he said, can you prove they're not red blood cells? It's like, why would he say that? Okay, boys and girls, this is why. The sooner they figure this out, the better. There's a bunch of people that believe in the beginning God created everything, and there's a bunch of people that don't believe in God. So how are they going to explain things? Well, it's kind of like a fairy tale. It goes like, once upon a time, nothing exploded and turned into people. Now, I don't have enough faith to believe that one, but that's where Jack is. And now they, when you hear this sort of thing, they use cold words to make you believe it. Oh, do you remember your, uh, your baloney detector from last year? Baloney detector? You remember that? When you hear millions of years or billions of years, you go, bah, right? Let's try it once. Millions of years? Really loud. Billions of years? Bah, that's right. That's right. And now you get to test it on this next interview. Be ready right away. Okay, let's listen to this. Is the fact that this stuff was fossilized as it was 7 million years old? Bah! Not at all. No. It's, it was utterly shocking. So you have to sort of rewrite the book as far as fossilization goes, I, I assume. Well, that's, that's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how, uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done don't allow for this. So if this material turns out to be actual remnants of the dinosaur, then yes, I think we will have to do some, um, certainly rethinking of some of the basics of the model of fossilization. You know, well, Mary, Mary, when I was reading about this story, I was amazed that in some of the capillaries, when you went to, to pull them, they snapped right back. Are you amazed at the quality of these remains? Absolutely. Seven million I, years old, huh? It's, it's just doesn't seem possible. Oh, but she says 70 billion, 70 million years. Bah, that's not right. Not right at all. Yeah, and so, boys and girls, you know more than most PhD scientists out there. Because Bob Enyart went on a cruise with all these smart people and he'd talk about dinosaur blood and dinosaur bones and they'd never heard of it. But you've heard of it. Yeah. And then Bob, he called up, he called up Jack, that's Mary's boss, and he said, I'll give you $20,000 if you carbon date that bone and Jack says well we wouldn't expect to find carbon in here because there's so such an old bone and Bob says well yeah but we wouldn't expect to find blood cells either would we and Jack says well you know what he kind of hymns and haws he says that's not going to help my question is help what Jack science which is observing and testing or evolution and boys and girls you're going to see this chart sometime somebody's going to try and teach you that and people came from apes when you ever see this it's so important to ask this question. Not only for you, but for everybody in the class. You ask, how did life begin? Ask. How did life begin? Ask it one more time. How did life begin? That's right. They don't know. They don't know how life began. And they'll try and flip you. They'll say, well, yeah, it's a, it's a, scientists have proved it. No, they haven't. That's a bluff. There's $10 million on the table if you can prove how life began. You don't even have to prove it. Just prove how the DNA got together by itself. Uh, they can't do it. So if they don't know how life began, how do they know life that God didn't do it? All right, and that brings me to Mark 10.6. What's my favorite verse? Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of the creation, this is Jesus talking, Jesus is a creationist. He says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. The beginning, not millions or billions of years later. So this is where you use your baloney detector. And also he made a male and female. That's boy and girl. So if you're a boy, every cell in your body says you're a boy. And if you're a girl, every cell in your body says you're a girl. But if somebody tries to say, <laughs> Yeah, if somebody tries to say, girls can be boys and boys can be girls, what did your baloney do? <laughs> ah, that's right, that's baloney with a capital B. All right, enjoy the evening.
And so, again, there's that battle raging between God's truth and Satan's lies. And, and it's real helpful if you can decide which side people are on. And a good question you can ask them is, how did life begin? What can you ask them? How did life begin? That's right. Are they going to point you to God or are they going to point you to evolution? Are you, yeah, are you, and so then if they, point you, if they don't point you to God, be very skeptical of what they're, be very careful of what you believe from them. And also you can ask them, where did people come from? And I do that stuff too. Okay, and the Bible, it does talk about astronomy and biology and geology and uh, anthropology. Did you know that? Let's take a look at what does the Bible say about astronomy. It says in the very first page, very first chapter, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So God made the, made the heaven and the earth. And guess what? Earth was there before the sun. Evolutionists say the sun was before the earth. You can't believe in both at the same time. Okay, and then it goes on and says that God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So God made the stars. And it, it's not even a whole verse. He made the stars also. There's billions, if not trillions, of stars up there in all these galaxies. And whenever they look out, when they try and they, they get at this James Webb, Webb telescope, they're looking farther back in the history as they, they think they're watch, looking at the beginning of the universe and they're going to see young galaxies. And they're just shocked. It's, uh, they talk, they're just, everyone is freaking out because it's mature galaxies. That happened with the Hubble Space Station, too. So their predictions are wrong. And then also biology, same chapter. After its kind, after their kind, after its kind, after their kind, after his kind. It's ten times it says that. That's what we see out there. Dogs produce cats. Dog, I mean, dogs produce dogs. Cats produce cats. Cows produce cows. Anybody grow on a, on a farm? Anybody help at all? I helped my brother with the dairy farm. And every time the cow had a calf. Didn't have a colt or a kitty or a pig. It was a calf. Everything produces after their kind. And that's what the Bible says. And that's what we see in the real world. But evolutionists say, hey, everything produces something other than their kind given enough time. And we never see that. So the Bible is accurate there. It also says the seed is in itself. And what came first, the chicken or the egg? Who thinks the chicken came first? Who thinks the egg came first? Okay, who doesn't know what came first? Okay, I didn't know what came first until I was 32. And I, heard somebody, and I heard somebody say, you know what, God said he made the birds, not the eggs. I said, oh, God made the chicken. And now what I found out, he made the chicken with the eggs inside. Okay, so God tells us what came first. Because if he made the eggs, what's going to hatch it? Okay, so the seed is in itself, okay? And that's biology. That's the proper perspective of biology. God made everything. Everything is designed. And then we talked about the, they, they talked about the dinosaur and how they, they had the dinosaur blood and the dinosaur bone, and that can't last millions of years. It's, and Jack Horner, he didn't want to carbon date it. Proved to me they're not red blood cells. You know, he's not real excited about finding blood cells which can't be millions of years old in a bone that's supposed to be millions of years old. It's like this, uh, this ice water. When did I take this out of the freezer? Was it millions of seconds ago? You know, like, you know, like days ago? Or was it just thousands of seconds ago? thousands of seconds ago. That's what they have. That's the problem they have with the dinosaur blood. Okay, and so then two of every kind. Did he need a horse, a zebra, and a donkey on the ark? No, he just needed the horse kind. Did he need a wolf, dog, and coyote? No, he just needed the dog kind. Kent Hovind was speaking at a college out east one time, and the guy just kind of mocked him and said, you, believe, you think that all these varieties of dogs came off the ark thousands of years ago? And he just kind of snickered at Ken Hovind. And Ken Hovind looks at him and says, well, look what you're teaching these students. You're teaching all the, these students that all these, all these dogs came from a rock. Because that's what evolution teaches. Everything came from rocks. And that, now things are changing rapidly. They, we've got the high ground. The, the biologists, we really do. Blind cave fish, you know, these, these fish that are in a cave they can't see. They're, you know, there's, eyes aren't any good. But yet, if they take them out of the cave and made them with something else, they get their sight back just like that. It's incredible the design that God put into it. And then geology. This is uh, in, the six, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where the fountains of the Great Deep broken up. That's geology. There was a worldwide flood. Worldwide flood. And there's a really neat theory out there called the hydroplate, which answers a lot of scientific problems and makes accurate predictions. 
And some of that stuff that shot out of the fountains of the Great Deep was going with such tremendous force that it went up into outer space, got super cold, came slamming down on the mammoths and froze them. And one of them froze standing up. That's a tough one for an evolutionist. And some of it was going up with such tremendous force that it kept on going. You got these dirty snowballs flying around the solar system. What's known as a dirty snowball? Anybody know? Comets. Yeah, comets. He's saying that comets came from the Earth, and they're making accurate predictions. They're finding stuff in comets that came from the Earth. And it could have only formed in liquid scalding water. It's very, it's an exciting theory. It's called the hydroplate. We had our very first conference this September. We've got a, we've got a professor of aeronautics at the U.S. Air Force Academy banging the hydroplate drum. And it's, uh, I think we're on the cutting edge of science if they allow this in the door. And it's given me so much confidence. I've gone into St. Cloud State Science Department four times now. Can you look at this theory? We're going to be getting, we're even going to be given a, a presentation on campus. This is really good. But you know what? It reminds me of Ignis Semmelweis. Anybody know who that is? Ignis Semmelweis. He's the guy who figured out you need to wash your hands after doing an autopsy before delivering babies. Wash your hands after cutting up dead things. That just makes all the sense in the world, right? But back then, he was ridiculed. They didn't like he was, he was, uh, he was bucking consensus. And that's kind of where we are right now. OK. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then people will try and say that it was a local flood. But does this sound like a local flood? And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the, all the high hills that were under the whole heavens were covered. That's all of them. You know, if it was a local flood, why, didn't they do, why did he have to have birds? You know, why didn't they just move? And then it talks about the mountains were covered. And it talks about uh, all in whose nostrils with the breath of life and all that were in dry land died. That's not just a local flood. Did but, it cover Mount Everest? Well, yeah. Did it cover Mount Everest? That's a good question. Okay, now Mount Everest wasn't there before the flood. There's a big difference between water covering Mount Everest or Mount Everest being under the flood. Okay, the, the, the mountains were formed during the flood. They rose up. And there's a lot of evidence for a worldwide flood. There's worldwide layers of sedimentary rock that can't be laid down by local floods. It had to be a worldwide flood. And you find dinosaur footprints on all the continents. And also there's uh, marine fossils on top of all the mountain ranges, unless they're volcanoes. And then uh, there's land animals mixed with marine animals. How's that gonna happen? Then it talks about anthropology. This is how we get all our different people groups. I never use the word race. You know, when there's a form and asks me to put down what race am I, I'll put other and I'll put human. There's only one race, the human race. We all came from Adam. And they're, Satan's really good at making us divide us into groups. Don't, get, don't fall for that. We're all sinners. We all need a savior. That's the main group. Is, uh, yeah, there's, there, there's the, there, we're, all, we're all the human race. And then are we followers of Christ or not. That's how Jesus divides the world. Those who believe and those who don't. Okay, now a lot of times, um, when I'm on campus, you need to define the terms. You know, you can ask, what do you, what do you mean by science? What do you ask? What do you mean by science? They'll say, well, science has proven the earth is millions of years old. Well, then you say, well, what do you mean by science? See, science is observation and testing. You can observe it, you can test it, you can repeat it. I was promoting this talk one time. I was, I was sitting underneath this poster, and a student came up to me and he says, he got a wrinkled up face, and he says, how can you have, he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, what do you mean, what do you mean? And he said, well, how can you have evolution versus science when evolution is science, right? And so I asked him the same question I taught you. I said, well, what do you mean by science? And he said, well, experiments, like in a lab. And I said, oh, the type of science that's observable and testable and repeatable and falsifiable, the scientific method type of science. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, evolution is none of that. And he said, well, sure it is. And I said, okay, name an experiment that proves evolution. And he said, well, there's lots of things. And I said, well, just give me your best thing. What's your best evidence for evolution? And if you ever want to stop a conversation for about five or 10 seconds, just ask, what's your best evidence for evolution? Their eyes will go to the ceiling, and then he finally said, geology. And I said, what about geology? And he said, the layers of rock. And he said, and I said, you believe that? And he said, the geologic column? 
And he said, yeah. And I said, you're kidding. You believe that layers of sedimentary rock laid down by water proves, proves that we came from a rock? I said, it could just as easily uh, prove that there was a worldwide flood in the days of Noah. And why did I say it proves we came from a rock? Because this is what their science book says. You know, it rained, rained on the rock for millions of years. That's how they got life. Rained on the rocks for millions of years. That's not science. That's a belief system about the past. And so we need to ask them questions to help them realize that they aren't believing science. They have a belief system about the past. And then do you see that word right here? Somehow. <laughs> Somehow, despite the harsh environment, living organisms appeared. Somehow is a huge fuzzy word. Somehow. I was talking to a biology instructor at a state college, and he said he always has his students write down, he have a journal of, full of, and write down fuzzy words. So then the students know when they're being taught science and when they're being taught fiction. Okay, and so I'm talking to the students, and then he finally says, well, what makes the most sense? And I said, exactly, that we were created by God or that hydrogen and helium turn into people because that's what an evolutionist believes. Hydrogen and helium came from the Big Bang and that turns into people. And that takes way more faith to believe than that God created us. Okay, so again, I'm trying to equip you to stand up for God's truth, but also to poke holes in the lies of evolution. And just the other month, just last month, a student invited me to a classroom at a state college. I was so excited. I thought I was going to a club and it was actually a class. The professor was there, and I got there at a the certain time, and he said, oh, I heard you're coming. Come on in. And he let me talk for 15 minutes. And so I talked to the students about, you need to see both sides if you want to think, but in the science class, you're only given one side. If you aren't given both sides, you're not really being educated, you're being indoctrinated. And so, uh, and so we talked about that, and when I got done, the professor asked me, well, what would you do if you ran the science department? I said we'd put every theory on the table, and then whether it points to God or not, we'd put all the theories on the table, and then we'd focus on the theory that makes accurate predictions. And then I also said we wouldn't teach belief systems about the past. We would just teach science. And then one of the students asked, well, do you believe in science or God? Or no, what did he say? Do you believe in God or science? And that's a false dichotomy. They try and make it an either or. And there's more than one answer to that. If somebody asked you, what, do you believe in God or science, what would you say? What? Who, who said both? There you go. That's what I said. I said both. I said science and the Bible go hand in glove. You know, and then, but uh, science and evolution, uh, uh, the Bible and evolution bang heads because evolution is not science. It's not observable, testable, repeatable. And then uh, one of the students said, isn't it sad that that question even comes up? And then I said, yeah, I know, it, I kind of understand, because the students aren't taught who brought us science. The who's who of science, These are, they're all creationists, like Newton and Pascal and Boyle and Faraday. You know, they were all mental giants. And I, and I even said, Matthew Murray, he invented a whole new field of science based on the Bible. Because the Bible said in Psalm 8, 8 that there's, there's paths in the sea. And so he thought, he thought, well, if God says there's paths in the sea, I'm going to go find them. And he found the ocean currents. And it sa saves the shipping industry billions of dollars because he looked at what God said and he found it. And then uh, I told him about uh, George Washington Carver. He's the peanut guy. You know, he had 10 minutes to speak in front of Congress about the importance of the peanut on the southern economy. And he was so interesting, they let him go for two hours. And then finally they said, how'd you learn so much about the peanut? And he said, an old book. And they said, what old book? And he said, the Bible. And he said, the Bible tells you about the peanut? And he says, no, the Bible tells me about the one who made the peanut. I asked him what to do with it. Right? Now, just think if we had that freedom to think about God and ask for his wisdom with our technology. And so that's what I told the students. You know? And so we want them to see both sides. And we want them to have a biblical perspective. Because if they reject Jesus, the creator, where are they going to end up? where their kids probably going to end up. And that's not what I want. I want them in heaven. And so I, so I go to, and I go wherever God answers, uh, opens the doors. And this is uh, Proverbs 26. It's kind of, and, and a student brought this up to me at college. He says there's contradictions in the Bible. And he brought up these verses. Verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. 
then it says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Okay, answer not a fool according to his folly. That's like when they try and say, okay, let's talk about the origin of the earth, but you can't use the Bible. You can only, you can only, you can only use the evolutionary, the, the, the so-called scientific evidence. It's like, no, I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not going to answer it according to your folly. But then there's another one, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And I'll do this a lot on campus. When I meet an atheist, I'll say, okay, we'll play in your ballpark. Without God, how did life begin? Okay, you guys ask that too. How did life begin? How did life begin? Right, you're going to meet people who don't believe in God. And so you ask them that. They can't explain it. Somehow it does not explain it. There's $10 million on the table if you can prove how the DNA organized itself. The other question you can ask is, where did matter come from? Okay, so again, ask these questions. Because if they can't answer them, hopefully it wakes them up at night. Anybody heard of Bill Nye or Ken Ham? Bill Yeah, they had a big debate. So we rented a room and we invited all the students and we filled up all the chairs. So we got all the chairs from the next classroom and we filled all them up. Then we got chairs from the lobby and there's what you don't see is there's four, four or five people in the front looking at the back. But during that debate, during Q&A, the moderator, and I think this was a 10-year-old kid who wrote down this question, he said, where'd the matter come from? Where'd the matter come from for the Big Bang? And Bill Nye, the scientist, science guy, he says, don't know, it's a mystery, that's why we do science. And then Ken Ham says, uh, Bill, there is a book that explains where matter came from. And here's, uh, this is uh, Eric Hovind. I like how he, he puts it in its simplest terms and it really makes the Big Bang look absurd, I think. Welcome to Creation Minute, I'm Eric Hovind. Today let me give you the evolutionary formula to make a universe. Start with some nothing, add to that some more nothing, then let's add some time. Then let's add some more time. We've got it! It's a perfectly balanced universe. Look at that sun, moon, stars, planets, everything's orbiting in perfect balance and order. You know evolutionists theorize that this formula can enable everything to make itself, even people with the exception of complicated man-made things like a microscope or a toothpick, but everything else about us in nature is the result of random chance and time. You don't even need raw materials. Those will make themselves. To learn more about creation, visit us at creationminute.com. Yeah, Eric Hoven, he does really good, good work. Yeah, and I'll be talking to college students too. And, it's, and I'll, I'll be on the sidewalk and I'll say, hey, do you think that building got put together by chance random processes? You know, do you think this room got together, you know, by an explosion at a light, an electric company, or was there planning and design? And they'll say, yeah, the building got put together by a designer. And I said, yeah, it would be absurd to think that it got put together by chance. And they'll agree. And I said, well, how much more absurd is it to think that your body got put together by chance? See, they live in a constant state of hypocrisy. And when you hear about the Big Bang, I want you to think about this guy, all right? He thinks he has it all figured out. He's gonna make a sprinkler. So, uh, you know, like this, and it should just sparkle a little bit. You've got the protective cloth down here. And actually, I think I'm turning the light up so it shows up better. He thinks he has it all figured out. Let's try this out. Just like your professor, the Big Bang, they got it all figured out. He didn't have it all figured out now, did he? And it blew up, <laughs> I believe so. And so they're going to say all these layers of rock came. Uh, this, is what, this is where they get the millions of years from. They got that ge supposed geologic column. All those layers are laid down over millions of years. And it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. But look at this video. 
Anywhere you go, you see these strata lines of rock all around the world, especially like where a road might cut through a mountain or maybe along a mountain. This one is in Utah. And this one is in Pennsylvania. Look at this one in Vermont. These layers are bent 90 degrees. <laughs> now wait a minute, you cannot bend rock, it'll simply break. And look at this one. Here's another really interesting feature, also in Pennsylvania. Look at all those severely bent layers. Look at a portion of the Rocky Mountains of Western Canada. Notice that these mountains are not only bent, but they're severely kinked. Look at these interesting layers of rock in Glacier National Park. Each of these layers is roughly as tall as a human. And look what they're doing. <laughs> these layers are not just bent or kinked. These layers literally bend back over on top of themselves, like an S pattern. How could that have happened over vast amounts of time? The simple and obvious answer is that they can't. They can't. No, they were pushed together during the flood, and that hydroplay theory explains a lot of that. And I'm going to leave this, I'm going to donate that video that it's from. It's called The Horror of the Flood. I never got the video because it's like, I don't know, I don't want to know the horrors of the flood. They should have called it Answers to the Flood or Evidence for the Flood. It's the best flood video I've ever seen. And I thought, I called him up and I said, hey, you know, I had a question on the gospel. And he says, yeah. And I agreed with it. And he said, okay, I'll take 50. And he says, well, wait, just hold on. Wait till I get home. I'll give you 50% off. And I said, great, I'll take 100. This is what I'm passing out for Christmas this year. Everybody gets one because it's got a really good message. It's got a good gospel at the end. And I just met with some friends, eight of us. We haven't seen each other in decades. We got together and I gave them all one of these videos. And I said, hey, let's meet together again February 20th because he's going to speak live at the University of Northwestern. And so that's what I, what's that? My dad's the vice president there. He is. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, so he's going to be speaking there on February 20th. So I encourage people to go on its mission imperative. And uh, yeah, it's a great witnessing tool. And uh, we're going to do Mike Snavely Day. Yeah, it's a lot of, he does really good work. And then at that same debate, somebody asked Bill Nye, the question came up to Bill Nye, how did consciousness come from matter? And Bill Nye, don't know, it's a mystery, that's why we do science. And then Ken Ham say, Bill, there is a book that explains where matter came from. And then again, where did people come from? And I go on campus a lot. I've been on a lot of campuses this year, and I do a survey. How did we get here? What do you, and they'll say, what do you mean? I said, people. How did people get here? Was, were we created? Were, did we evolve? Was it an intelligent design? And this is at a, a, a community college. And creation one, 16 to 6. Yeah. And that after all those billions of years, billions of dollars that they've tried to brainwash evolution into thinking and all these decades, creation still won. And I asked somebody who put it, he stroked under creation. I said, why did you put it under creation? And he said, well, that's because, that's, because uh, that's where everyone else is putting it. And so you got, you got 15 to 20% on either side. You're not going to change their mind. But the, lip, but the ones in the middle, they'll go wherever the evidence, wherever the flow is. So what we need your help is to get people flowing in the creation, creation uh, 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 perspective. And I did the same thing at St. Cloud State. And it was like 43 to 39. And I figured St. Cloud State would just be an evolutionary landslide, and it wasn't. So that gives me a lot of hope. You know, after all that billions of tax money, all those museums, NASA, National Geographic, one perspective, people are still, they still don't believe we came from rocks, which is good. And I was out in Pennsylvania, Altoona. This is uh, Penn State's campus, and it was 17 to 13, so it's pretty close. I think there should be a creation booth at every fair. Your school should have one. You guys would have so much fun doing this. Have a creation booth at every fair and then ask, have questions of the day. And the first one was, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So we get to talk about creation and the chicken one. And then I asked, how did life begin? Remember, somehow or God. And uh, God won by a landslide. And then I asked, did, hi did hydrogen and helium turn into people? Because that's what the Big Bang formed, hydrogen and helium. 
And no, people did, did not believe that at all, you know, about the vast majority. But there's a lot of people that don't know. And that's why we ask these questions. And then I asked them, what are you, A, a mutated animal or made in God's image? And uh, most people think they're made in the image of God. And I agree. You know, I, don't, I disagree that they're mutated animals, but that's what the textbook will tell them. And so sometimes I just throw this, this is what your belief system says. Are you really sure you want to believe that system? And so we started the creation club in St. Cloud, or Sock Rapids. And now we're going to start meeting at the, we were meeting at a church. And now we're going to start meeting at the public library and see how that goes. We used to do that and then COVID knocked us out. But anyhow, they did a, a Gallup poll. And that top line there, most people, 40% of Americans, believe that God made man in his present form less than 10,000 years ago. 40%. And then 38% believe that God used evolution to make people. And then the very bottom line, that's people that think that uh, there was no God. People just evolved. And so most people believe God created man in his present form. And yet you look at the science books and on TV and the museums, you think that it's not that case that way at all. But it is. So again, we just need to keep on pushing, pushing the creation buttons. Okay, how did life begin? Your, your body is made of organs, and your organs are made of tissues, and your tissues are made of cells. And look at what's happening inside your cells, 100 trillion times over. Cells are full of specialized components that perform functions vital to their existence. But how do these components get to the right locations inside the cell to perform their functions? For larger components, a transportation system is needed. Meet the kinesin. Masterpieces of microengineering, kinesins are miniature motorized machines that carry cargo from one part of the cell to another, walking along self-assembling highways called microtubules. And I saw that and it's like, well, how do those microtubules know where to go? And my son saw it and he goes, where do they get the energy to move? And keep in mind, this is supposed to all happen by chance, random processes. There's no way this came together by chance. It's way too sophisticated. And so let's go to the energy source, ATP synthase. It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world. An amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. It generates adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. Yes, yeah, so you need that energy source to live. How did you live before you had that energy source? It's like Fred Williams' son, he was out in Colorado at a college, and he'd meet the evolutionists, and he would ask him, well, how did vital organs evolve? We can't live without, they're vital for a reason, we can't live without them, how did we live before they evolved? And nobody, no evolutionist cannot explain it. But you just look at the design of this. The ATP synthase machine has many parts we recognize from human-designed technology. A rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and other basic components of a rotary engine. The ATP synthase is one of thousands of elegantly designed molecular machines inside your cells that make your life and all known life possible. ATP synthase, an example of intelligent design. Intelligent design, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, one time I went to the community college at St. Cloud and I didn't have a kiosk and the free speech zone is in the middle of nowhere so I went to their lunchroom with this I was promoting this talk and I taped this to my table you know who's your daddy evolution a theory and crises guaranteed not to make a monkey out of you and I sat at the I sat right by the door so most people had to walk right by me and it was it was up higher and there was a woman there who was making points for evolution or trying to and I was making points for creation. And I said, if you went out to your car and you popped the hood on your car and you looked at your engine, do you believe that that engine evolved? And she said, yeah, science has evolved to make the engine. 
And I said, no, 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 not science evolved. The engine evolved by chance random processes without intelligence. And she goes, no, no, clearly. That was the engine had intelligence behind it. And I said, yeah, a dead giveaway for intelligence is multiple parts working together with precision timing for a purpose. And she agreed. And so I said, guess what? Multiple parts working together with precision timing for a purpose. We were designed too. And then she finally left and a student came up to me and she said, do you know who that was? I said, no, no idea. She said, that was the biggest, baddest atheist we got on campus. And she goes, and you kicked her butt. She said, I was texting your comments to my friends. And it's not that I'm smarter than her, I'm probably not, it's just that I'm right. We're, we're designed, clearly we were designed. And yeah, I gave this talk, this is one of the first ones I gave at St. Cloud State. And, and then you can also ask, hey, what came first, the heart or blood cells? I was at a museum down in, I was at the Mastodon Museum in St. Louis. And I asked the person who was working there, I said, hey, what came, you know, they got the geologic column there, and I asked, well, what came first, the heart or blood cells? And they said, blood cells. And I said, well, what good are blood cells without a heart? And they said, the heart. And they said, well, what good is a heart without blood cells? And I said, okay, I'll give it to you. And all these supposed billions of years and all this big universe, we got the first heart with the first blood cells at the same time what good are they without lungs? Or a digestive system, or a nervous system, or muscle system? Do you see how everything has to be fully formed right from the get-go, or we're dead? And so then they started, uh, yeah, then they kept a closer look on me. And I took a picture during one of their videos, and the guy came up to me and said, you can't take a picture, you gotta delete that. So anyhow, but anyhow, just ask questions. It's like the, the mousetrap. Take away one of those pieces of the mousetrap, it's not gonna work. Okay, and then we've got the dinosaur blood. Remember, and they, and they, they actually carbon dated. Remember Bob Enyard, he, gave Jack, he offered Jack Horner, I'll give you $20,000 if you carbon date that bone. And Jack won't do it because if you find carbon-14 in there, it's not millions of years old. And so he won't do it, but these guys did. There was eight of them at the 2012 Geophysics Symposium uh, meeting in Singapore, and they, found, they did eight dinosaur specimens and they got years from 22,000 to 38,000. That's not millions of years. And the, but the people who ran the symposium said the abstract was removed from the conference website by two chairmen because they could not accept the findings. Unwilling to challenge the data openly, they erased the report from public view. And that's what evolutionists tend to do. They sweep it under the rug. They don't give you the microphone. And I'm trying so hard to get the microphone at St. Cloud State or at the community college. And I'm gonna have it on a week from Tuesday. I'm gonna be presenting the hydroplate theory on campus and I'm inviting the professors and the students and all everybody. But um, again, you can go in and see how they did that. They found, this is a bone cell. A bone cell that they found in a triceratops horn, Mark Armitage did. And he got it published in a secular journal. And what happened to him? You think he got a raise? They fired him. All he did was say, hey guys, I found this bone cell, and he got it published, and they fired him. See, they don't like people having information that goes against their religion of evolution. And he sued them and said, you can't fire me, that's wrongful termination, and he won. But he's not working there anymore. So who really won? And there's case after case after case, so that people, if they can't discredit the information, they'll try and discredit the person who brings it out. And now he's finding nerves. Dinosaur nerves, anybody see a nerve in there? You really can't, you have to hit it with UV light and then it'll glow. And Mark Armitage, he'll, if you get enough homeschoolers together or enough people, students, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll do one of these uh, workshops for you. And these are his photographs in front of, on, on the cover of microscopy, microscopy Today. When you zoom in on, that, on those nerves, you just zoom in farther and farther, it's more and more beautiful. And uh, yeah, but he's not working there. And again, this is the, the, the ice. You know, 65 million years ago, that'd be, or 65 million seconds, that'd be two years. Who thinks I took this bottle of ice out of the, out of the freezer two years ago? No, but if it was only 4,400 years ago, that's about an hour and 13 minutes. Yeah, that would work. Okay, so that's the problem. The red blood cells are the ice in the bone. It can't last millions of years. All right, so just understand. And then there's places. I, I took this picture. 
There was a flood that went through the Paluxy River 100 some years ago, ripped off a layer of bedrock, and there was dinosaur footprints. You can still see those today. I went there probably 10 years ago. And then uh, Carl Baugh and Don Patton, they say not only were there dinosaur footprints, there were human footprints with the dinosaur footprints. And so I encourage you to watch that video. It's called uh, Footprints in Stone, Overwhelming Evidence of Dinosaurs and Man Together. It's on YouTube. Dinosaurs with human footprints. And I had the opportunity to interview him at the Grace Conference last year. And this is what he said. 1981, in the spring, I made a trip to Glen Rose, Texas. And there, uh, made a discovery that changed my entire life. I was completing, I was completing the masters in archeology span and was assigned by my mentor to direct an original excavation. And in the process of doing that, after removing the limestone layer, discovered a trail of dinosaur footprints, 19 all together, 19 successive dinosaur footprints. Removed more limestone and 18 inches from one of those dinosaur footprints, I discovered a 16 inch human footprint. Genuine in every detail, the great toe which is unique to man, second, third, fourth little toe, metatarsal arch, the ball section of the foot, the uh, medial section, which includes the interior ball section of the foot, and the lateral with the bulge. All of that is unique to mankind. And continued to excavate and discovered three more. So a series of left, right, left, right, human footprints among dinosaur footprints. I called the press, they flew down by helicopter. The next morning, uh, I got on the plane at DFW to go back to St. Louis, and headlines in the newspaper stated, tracks step on evolution. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and then the battle began. Yeah, there was a big battle. So they try and to, <clears throat> they, they break the footprints, you, can, you have to listen to Don Patton. He's on Real Science Radio. They interview him. They also interviewed uh, Carl Baugh just recently on rsr.org. And what I'm encouraging people to do is get all the information and come to your own conclusion. There's some information out there, and you should listen to people that have been there, not people who haven't been there. And this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the final conclusion is very simple. Man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously. And even though they're separated by evolutionary dogma by at least 64 million years, they not only live contemporaneously, but were caught in a worldwide flood. And this is devastating to evolutionary theory, but very supportive of the biblical record of creation as detailed in the Holy Scriptures. Right. Now, when you found that footprint, that human footprint, what, 18 inches from a dinosaur footprint yes. in the same layer, what did that do to your mindset? Because were you a theistic evolutionist at the time? At, at that point, now, I had graduated from theistic evolution to uh, an old age creation position. I put a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. There is no gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. So I was a progressive old age creationist. Uh, but it, it really is in the same camp, unfortunately. So this destroyed my paradigm completely. I didn't sleep for four days and nights. And uh, then I went back to St. Louis and the press started calling and, and took the news, world, the controversy worldwide. And I'd like to say that every honest person has identified with it. Uh, they too have to go through a catharsis, a complete change of mind mindset in order to accept this and even some very good creationists are hesitant to accept this right. because the evolutionists have targeted everything we do yep. and of course uh, uh, propagandized right. every false idea they right. can, but that's fine. Right. We, we would expect that yeah. because this destroys their religion. It does. It does. But it, it does. supports the true religion and the true God and the Bible as being the Word of God. Amen. So he, he, th he believed in billions of years until he saw those footprints. And then he couldn't sleep for four nights. So he was intellectually honest and he came to the Bible's true. It was only thousands of years ago. 
And it was clear that dinosaurs lived with people. This is a stegosaur, stegosaurus carved in a, a temple in Cambodia. Then they carved all over the place in castles. How could they see them if they've never, you know, how, how could they carve them if they've never seen them? And they even got the skin right on them. And there's legends of dinosaurs or dragons all over the world. It bothered Carl Sagan so much he wrote a book, Dragons of Eden. How could people describe the same animal if they were separated by time and distance? Oh yeah, Job 40:15 is, what, do you, what is Job, or what is Behemoth? And the study notes will say, well, he's got a big belly. Uh, is this a behemoth? Or is this a behemoth? Or maybe this is a behemoth. <laughs> no, no, no. It moves his tail like a cedar tree. These aren't cedar trees. Those aren't cedar trees. It was a long-necked dinosaur. And now there's research coming out that they think Leviathan was some ancient uh, crocodile, a, a huge crocodile with navel cavi na nasal cavities. But this stuff was, was uh, brought up. Okay, but how do they get people to believe in evolution? Um, I asked these questions too. I was at a kiosk next to the anthropology department one time, and I said, why did they cut hi Lucy's hip and twist it to make it look human? Lucy is our supposed ape-like ancestor. Okay, and uh, this is what the textbook says, uh, uh, that Lucy has a remarkably complete skeleton. Remarkably complete. There's 200 some bones in your body. What would remarkably complete be? Maybe 180? And that's, this is their best evidence for, you know, it's in all the textbooks, it's in the museums, Lucy, very famous, that uh, basically says that we came from apes. And I, when I was in college one time, they were talking about Lucy and social science, and I said, who cares? What difference does it make? We're here, we're now. But I look back, it makes a big difference. Because if Lucy is true, the Bible's wrong. But if Lucy's false, the Bible could be right. And so I've learned, I've grown, okay, but remarkably complete. This is nearly complete. Nearly complete, remarkably complete. Are they telling us the truth? Does that look nearly complete? There's 40-some bones. So basically, they're flat out lying in the textbooks, okay? And not only that, you know, then does Lucy have, did they find any hand bones or feet bones or eyes? No. no, they made it look like an ape man. They put human fingers and human feet and whites in the eyes. Apes don't have whites in the eye. They try to make Lucy look as human as possible. But look what they did to Lucy's uh, hip. This is uh, In Search of Human Origins with Don Johansson. I think this is from Nova. So this is a secular production. Listen to what they say. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. So it's a chimps. Lucy's hemp was a chimp. Or Lucy's hip was a chimp, is what they just said. Couldn't walk like a human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilization. It doesn't fuse after you're dead. It's not going to fuse together. After Lucy died, some of her bones lying in the mud must have been crushed or broken, perhaps by animals browsing at the lake shore. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. Unless she's a chimp, then it's not anatomically impossible. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. If I told you what they did, you wouldn't believe me, so I'm going to show you. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. So do you see what they did there? 
It was a chimpanzee hip, and they cut it and <coughs> twisted it to make it look like a human hip. This is their video. And I talked to an anthropology major who didn't know that's what they did. And I said, I can show you on my computer. No, I don't want to see it. Okay, so that's how they get people to believe in evolution. Okay, we're almost ready to wrap this up. What's the name of my YouTube channel? Solidify your faith. Very good. Solidify your faith. Say it really loud. Solidify your faith. All right. What, what word uh, deter, uh, makes your bologna detectors go off? Millions and billions of years. And what? And then when you meet somebody who doesn't believe in God, what do you ask them? What came first, chicken or the egg? I heard it over there. Yeah, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Or my, I usually go to how did life begin? How did life begin? They can't answer it. Okay, so if they don't know how life began, how do they know God didn't do it? And it takes way more faith to believe hydrogen and helium turn into people than God made us. And so when you meet people who don't believe in God, ask that question because that will help them realize they have faith too. They actually have more faith than you do. Okay, now I want to wrap you up with Daniel. Dan, we're going to wrap up with Daniel Kish. Anybody ever heard of Daniel Kish? No. Okay, his backstory is when he was uh, nine months old, he had cancer and lost an eye. Lost the other eye when he was 13 months old. And so he started to click with his tongue and his brain can process those sound waves, so now he can ride a bike blind. And this is Daniel Kish. It is the most amazing thing I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of amazing things being in this for 10 years, but this by far is the most amazing thing. And, and there's just amazing what God's designed into us. And my question is, hey, what's God designed into you that we haven't figured out? So this is him. As a kid, I was raised to think of myself as, as pretty unremarkable. My parents, their emphasis, their regard for me was you're, you're a kid like any other kid. He got his first bicycle at the age of six. I learned, I learned to click like a maniac and I learned to ride around the neighborhood. And if I ran into a pole, my parents just didn't make a big deal out of it. Running into a pole is a drag, but never being allowed to run into a pole is a disaster. Riding a bike blind has become a kind of stunt he does to raise awareness that the brain can adapt and that people can do far more than they realize. years ago, it, it was just unheard of. So if you don't close your eyes for just a moment, okay, and you're going to learn a bit of flash sonar. Now you have scientists studying it, you have instructors wanting to learn it, you have instructors wanting to teach it, you have blind people wanting to learn it. Being able to navigate comfortably in any environment, under any circumstances, nothing can be more fundamental to freedom than being able to do that. Yeah, but I contacted him and I said, would you like to be uh, interviewed for Real Science Radio? And he got back to me and he said, sure. Every Friday there's a science show, rsr.org, it's my favorite website. <clears throat> and he said, sure. And I asked, could we, get, could we interview your parents too? Because I'd love to see their mind thought process of getting their blind kid a bicycle. And he pretty much said, well, they're kind of microphone shy, so we never got to interview them. But did you notice how riding into a pole is a drag, but not being allowed to ride into a pole is a disaster? And did you notice how his parents never took the obstacles away? He overcame those obstacles, and that gives him confidence. And that's what I'm going to challenge you guys to do. Overcome your obstacles. Don't expect somebody to take them, over, take them away. Grow through those obstacles. And then uh, rsr.org slash Batman. You can hear the interview, slash Batman. I am going to be speaking tonight at the University of Northwestern, where your dad's vice president. Yeah, so feel free to come by. I'm going to be talking about God's amazing designs, God's clues. All right. Um, and then, uh, does anybody have any questions? There are people that try and squeeze evolution into the Bible. 
They try and do theistic evolution, progressive creation, framework, all that stuff. And I always bring them to this verse. This is Mark 10, 6. This is Jesus talking. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. <coughs> Not millions of years later. It's the very beginning. And so if people, aren't, if people aren't creationists, they're not following the example of Jesus. We're supposed to follow. Jesus is our example, right? Right, and if we're not following his example, we're on real thin ice. Plus, he made them male and female. You know, it's kind of hard, sad to say, but it has to be said. You know, God, God didn't make mistakes. If you're a girl, you're a girl. If you're a boy, you're a boy. Every cell in your body says so. So be the best one you can be. You know, and if anybody tries to tell you any otherwise, uh, that baloney detector should go off. All right. Okay. I think. All right. You guys have been very, very attentive. I appreciate your attention. Uh, one last call. Any anybody? Um, any last question? Okay. I'm going to challenge you to thank your parents tonight. They make a lot of sacrifices. So you can come to this school and make it easy for them. When I taught at junior high, or junior church, ages three to first grade, and every week it's like, okay, were you a sail or an anchor this week? You know, your parents have a, you're, you're in a, you're in a, your family's a boat, and your mom and dad are trying to get somewhere. Did you help them get there, or did you slow them down? Were you a sail, you help them out, or were you an anchor, they had to stop and deal with you? And I encourage the kids to say, hey, mommy, what can I do for you? Daddy, what can I, how can I help you? And I encourage you to do that every day. And that'll uh, build a trust with your, fa with your parents. Because you guys want the car someday, right? <laughs> right? Well, you ain't getting the car if they didn't trust you. If you want to get the car, hey, take care of your bicycle. Clean up your room. You know, there's blessings for honoring your parents. And as a parent, it's so much easier, you know, when we're all pulling the same direction. And also be, uh, you know, be a sail in the classroom, too. That boat's trying to get somewhere, too. Make sure you're not slowing the class down. You know, be a blessing to your teacher, be a blessing to your pastor, be a blessing everywhere, and then see how God blesses you. It's sowing and reaping. And what you do matter. What you do matters. And I think I'm out of time. Um, thank you so much. There are cards on my table over there. Feel free to take one. There's also wristbands. And I am going to give this to, yeah, I'm going to do donate these to your library. All right, thank you very much.